thanks for the invitation. I hope I'm not going too fast for the translators. Yes. Uh, so the, the so what I want to present to you is you already heard. Uh, you, you already heard the idea that modernity really is about speeding up our life and our world, that modernization really is about the dynamization of the world, which has some negative consequences, which you see in this image. It's, it, it feels, and I think the longer it goes, the more, the more it feels like being caught in a hamster wheel. The idea of this hamster wheel or of the hamster wheel, is that you have to go faster and faster without really moving, right? Just to stay in place. This is, uh, uh, this is maybe the basic insight of what I want to tell you, that the problem, I, I consider it a problem, the problem of acceleration society is that, that we lose the sense of going forward through speed and movement. And it's replaced by the sense of having to go faster and faster just to stay the same, just to stay where we are. You see it from Spain, but it's exactly the same in Germany. It's even the same in India and elsewhere. Well, maybe it's not exactly the same in India, but let's take Europe. Um, the, if, if we don't grow, if you don't go faster next year, if you don't produce more, if you don't become more innovative, you cannot stay as you are, right? So that's a, a, the basic sociological insight, if you so like. I want to move in three steps. The first is uh, I, w I, want to, uh, I want to present to you this basic idea that modernity is acceleration, and acceleration comes through the logic of dynamic stabilization. This society can only dynamize, uh, uh, can only stabilize dy dynamically. And the second step is then I want to explain to you what social acceleration really is and how it feels. It comes in three dimensions. Actually, maybe I can. It's okay, no problem. <laughs> okay, then, uh, then the the third step is I want to po point out to you why this why this process is not in why, why this leads to certain pathologies. I really believe that the major crisis we suffer and we experience in our, in our today's world can be uh, understood as a, as crisis of desynchronization and as a crisis of dynamic stabilization. And in the last step, I somehow want to uh, to at least briefly touch upon how we might overcome uh, this uh, situation and, and create, a, hopefully, a better world, right? So, dynamic stabilization. I mean, the, 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 my starting point was what you find here with P by Peter Conrad, uh, that modernity seems to be about the acceleration of time. I looked at the theories of modernity, and I found the sociological theories. I found a lot of analysis, and, and, and analysis which said, well, modern, modernization is about rationalization or about structural differentiation or about individualization or economization. And I thought, well, but what about time? Isn't it, is, isn't it an important fact about this process of modernization that life seems to speed up all the time? Um, actually, I wanted to, to make another uh, a starting point, when I, I, which I do it with my students very often, right? I ask them to imagine for a second that maybe there are aliens in outer space and they have very good cameras, right? And they look down on Earth, they watch us. And what, 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 what would they see? And I think when they might have the cameras turned on Earth for maybe thousands of years or hundreds of years and they would see May, probably they think it's a boring planet. There's not too much going on, right? They would occasionally see some people move vast distances. For example, Marco Polo in 1280, he moved to China, to Beijing, but it took him many years to get there, and then he stayed there for a few years. Apparently, even his father has, had, had done the same. But it was isolated people mainly, and, uh, and then for many years not much happened, and even those who traveled, traveled slowly. And the same for shipping. There was some movement on the oceans, mainly along shorelines, but maybe it's true that even the Vikings discovered America. But these alien cameras would detect, okay, occasionally there's movement over vast stretches, but it's quite slow. 
And then, in the, when, as we approach the 18th century, in the 17th century, they, if they have very good cameras, they would see there is an increase in, the di in dynamics on Earth, so to speak, because uh, there were more ships propping up, and, uh, and, and, and on Earth people tried to move faster without having new technologies. They tried to, to make the roads go straight instead of curving around, that, that makes you go faster. And they found out that if you exchange the horses before the horse carts more often, right? Or if you exchange the horses, you can travel faster. Before, they just they, they, there was horse ride, horse carts, of course, but they had to wait at night until the horses were uh, uh, did get, get enough sleep and uh, recreated. So next day they would travel on. And then in the 17th century, they found out, oh no, if we exchange the horses, the tired horses are just left behind and you take new horses, we can go faster. So there was some increase in the, in the dynamics down on Earth. But after, or from the 18th century onward, all of a sudden there was a dynamic, like, like an escalatory logic. Right? The, it started with a steam engine. Soon there were steamships propping up. And that had two effects. There were more ships on the ocean, and they were go going much faster, traveling particularly, but not only, from uh, Europe to the United States, for, uh, to, to America. And uh, of course, then there, there also appeared the, the railways. Right? At first, it was just a few, and they were going not very far and very slowly, about 30 kilometers. We have heard about that already. But then the, the railway system kind of expanded. The, the, the locomotives went faster and there was a whole net, not just in Europe, but then in North America and in other places of the world, India, South Africa. So the cameras would realize, oh, steamships, railways, the dynamics is increasing. Now, as we moved through the 18th century, something like the, the, the bicycle was invented. In French, there's c'est le vélo, velocitas, speed. So even the bicycle is a modern invention, and it increased the speed of, of circulation in a city, for example. Right? And then, of course, also the automobile came along. Right? Think of what the cameras would record. Oh, what the hell is going on down there, right? There's trucks, there's mobiles, there's steam engines, there's railways. And then, of course, in the 20th century, there are airplanes coming up. Right? As I speak to you right now, there's about between one and two million people up in the air. Right? At every second of the day, one to two million people move up in the air. So that means there is an enormous dynamization of people, of, but also of, uh, of, um, of resources, of materials. It's the resources, uh, the raw materials being uh, transported from one place to the other, and the goods and commodities being um, uh, sent around, right? So there's an, no an enormous material dynamization of the world. But that's not all. If they have very good cameras, they would realize. In addition, there's an incredible exchange, a permanent flow of money, of capital going back and forth within fractions of seconds, but also of ideas and images and messages and com communication, right? So it's really, when you ask yourself what is what is modernization from a kind of external perspective? You see, modernization is a process of dynamization, of acceleration, and, of, and uh, connected to this, a change of temporal structures. And when I, because the series here is about time, and when I started to do my work, I thought, okay, uh, before I, before, before I um, uh, write on acceleration, I have to solve the question of what is time? And so I looked at all of the temporal sociology of time, and I found out they have a totally different conceptions of time, right? There, there, is no, there is no sociological conception of time. So I thought, okay, you have to go to philosophy, right? The philosophers need to answer the question of what time is. But there is no good answer. There is no philosophical, there is no, no, no answer from physics or astronomy, nor any other answer, right? Some philosophers of physics, let's say philosophers like Kant, they think temp time is an invert feature in the status quo. N I'm not sure whether this sounds technical or complicated to you, but the, 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 but the idea is very easy, right? You can, uh, you, can see it, uh, you can see it in particular when you look 
when you look to uh, the economy. If, if you can look to Spain or to Germany or to America, it doesn't matter where you look to. But let's start with, uh, with Spain since we're here. Yeah, I say Spain, right, and not Catalonia. It's very difficult to understand from the outside anyway. <laughs> but in this country, okay. <laughs> If, if, if the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the economic output does not grow, right, the, the gross domestic product, then you cannot keep your society, you cannot keep the structure if, without growth. And growth is achieved through acceleration, through increasing productivity and through coming up with innovations. And if you don't do this, you cannot stay as you are. Right? You will lose jobs without growth, without innovation. You will certainly lose jobs, and with losing jobs, companies will close down. And when jobs are lost and companies, of course you know this all very well, if, if jobs are lost and companies close down, the tax revenue is decreasing. Right? The state income goes down, but expenditure goes up, because you have to pay the unemployed, and, and those. you have to try to create new jobs, you need to do something about the economy uh, uh, running again. And, and that means you have, a, in, in the budget system, you get, you get a very bad disbalance, and that brings the whole political system into crisis. But you see it I, right now, as far as I know, there's no government in Spain, right? <laughs> Actually, yeah, but you see the same all over the world, right? That, 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 that puts pressure on the political system and maybe on the whole fabric of society. So, but you can also explain it more economically. In a capitalistic society, Money is only invested, and, and that means economic activity only starts when there is hope or a promise of an increase. Right? You only invest money in a shop if you have the hope, the, the, the justified hope, expectation, that you can get a bit more money out of your investment than you invested. No, no one would do any economic tr transaction uh, if, he was, uh, if he or she were certain to lose money. Ma Economic activities are only done when there is a promise of making more money out of it. You see this in this formula, money, commodity, money prime. This money prime means some form of profit is necessary, at least as the expectation, for doing any form of economic transaction. This is particular to the modern economy. But you see this, you see in this formula that there always has to be this prime, right? There needs to be an addition. So, the, so there are two explanations. You can also explain it, by the way, through the money system, because money only gets into the world, given out by the banks, with a, prom with a certain uh, form of credit, right? So, or an interest, right? So if, if 100 euros are put into the market, there's always and necessarily the promise that it has to come back as 102 or 105 euros. I mean... It's interesting to see where we are going in the future, but so far this has been the system, right? So, so the, the logic of growth is a structural necessity. It's not because we want, for example, when, when your governments say, and your politicians, we need to keep the growth engines going or starting again. They don't mean because we don't have enough bread or enough houses or enough cars. In fact, it's the other way around, right? Because Spain has built too many houses. Because of that, now a lot of people are without homes. By the way, you see that the system is quite perverse by this, right? I mean, the, it's the same in the US, right? I, I mean, it's not the scarcity of things that, 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 uh, that necessitates growth, but it's the, 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 it's the logic of the system that requires the growth of, any, of whatever it is to keep the structure. For me personally, or for my thinking, it's important to see that this logic of increase and growth is not just in the economy. This logic of permanent increase of dynamic stabilization, of keeping the structure through increase, through acceleration and innovation, is also, for example, in our conception of science, even of science, or you could say of knowledge. Because for most societies we know, for pre-modern societies up to the 18th century, knowledge is like a treasure which you keep and preserve and you hand it down from one generation to the next, right? So all cultures sustain themselves through knowledge. You have to know how to build your home and how to uh, grow your food, for example, or how to hunt the deer or the animals. And you also have to have some knowledge about how to do the religious ceremonies or rituals and so on. 
But this kind of knowledge is normally derived either from your ancestors or from them from some holy scriptures or so. And there, most cultures we know try to preserve them as they are. But in our modern society, the highest authority of knowledge is science. In German, you see this very nicely through the term Wissenschaft, right? Schaft means creation. Knowledge is the thing which is permanently created anew. So the Wissenschaft system, the system of science, is not based on scholarly knowledge, which is handed down from the teachers to the pupils, but it's permanently pushing the border, coming up with new insights, new knowledge, reaching deeper into outer space, going deeper into the matters in detail and so on. So even science, our knowledge system, is based on dynamic stabilization. We have to permanently increase, accelerate, innovate in order to keep science. And it, even in politics, you see it. Democracy is the idea that you have to permanently re-elect politicians. It's not the fact that there is the king given by God and standing tall. And if the king, the, Edward I, dies, then Edward II takes his place and nothing really changes. No. In the politics of a democratic society, you see dynamic stabilization. Every four years, there's a new election. And the new election, those who want to be elected have to come with the programs. And in those programs, they always make promises of increase. If you elect me, then you will have more homes, jobs, whatever it is. So politics, science, the economy, even the arts are all based on this, uh, on, uh, on this logic of, of increase, of acceleration, innovation, and growth to keep the system. So my, my, my very important insight is that capitalism, but actually I would say the whole of modernity, right? They are, they are, this is true for capitalism, it's true for modernity. Even though they are very flexible and fast changing and, uh, and, and adaptive, and there are many versions of capitalism like the Anglo-Saxon model and, the, uh, and, the, uh, and maybe the Rhineian model and the Japanese model, but for all of them there remains th this basic insight that we need growth, innovation and acceleration in order to keep the structure, to keep the system going, right? Max Weber, the sociologist, calls this the iron cage of modernity. You cannot escape the necessity for increase, for acceleration, innovation, and growth. Okay. Now, I think it's very obvious and very important to see that this changes the way you and I experience time. It changes the way we are set in time, and it explains why acceleration comes about. Because we can increase almost everything in our lives, but you cannot increase time. We have 24 hours per day, and there's nothing to do about it. We have 365 days per year. You cannot increase time. But you could say we can increase lifetime. Well, that's true, but for one thing, it's not a very huge amount of increase we can get there, certainly not an escalatory curve. But secondly, the time we organize, no, the, the way we organize time biographically leads to the fact that this long, this long, this enlargement of time at the end of our lives is like an empty time. It's economically kind of useless time and therefore aggravates the problem, right? F because we have to uh, we have to come up with the resources for the for the enlarged for the uh, for the longer time at the end of our lives before that. So what you see is that we have a huge squeeze on young people to be fast, efficient, and so on. Uh, and a problem at the at the other side of life. So so whatever uh, th this is not so important. But the, the basic fact is that for a day or for a year or for a month you cannot increase time. We have increased the number of goods, for example, by necessity. The number of goods we produce and distribute and consume per year or so has ex exponentially increased. For example, the average European household. Spanish household, let's say, right, contained about 400 objects in, uh, in the year 1900, around 1900, 400 different objects. And by now it's 10,000. So, so you see what this logic of increase leads to. It, it leads in, in substantive terms to escalation. Even if the growth rate is low, like only 1%, the total amount of what you have to increase per year is huge. 
And it's not just the fact that the household contains 10,000 goods. It's also true that these goods are exchanged at an increasing pace. Right? We throw away basically everything we have before it's really outworn and replace it by new goods. Right? For example, with, it's certainly true with all the technologies. These microphones will probably be gone and the computer will certainly be gone and the cell phone will be gone. But even my jacket will probably be thrown away before I can't wear it anymore. Right? Because it's out of fashion. It's not nice enough and so on. It's not modern enough. So the number of goods has increased, and the, but, but also the exchange rate has increased. But now you have to distribute your time per day or per year, not to the 400 goods, but to the 10,000 objects. You have to clean them, you have to take care of them, but you also want to use them. Of course, you have some objects at home which you never use, maybe some expensive objects. Perhaps in your flat or in your house, there's a telescope or a, an expensive keyboard which you never use. Right? Th then, actually, this is almost a source of guilt. We feel bad about these things, right? Because there is the object for which I don't have enough time. Right? So these objects somehow, it's like, like they, call out, they call on us to devote time for them. So if, if you have always the same amount of time and more and more goods, then you, need, you have less and less time to distribute to every good. And, and this is not only true for consumption, of course, also in production. We have to produce these goods at an ever shorter period of time. It's the same with the number of contacts. Kenneth Gergen, he's an uh, American uh, so, uh, so, uh, psychologist, he has calculated that the average commuter who goes back and forth from Connecticut to New York for work meets more people in, in, on his way to work and back than the average medieval person in, met in the whole of his or her life. Right. So, so you are connected with an incredible amount of people through Facebook, of course, through Twitter, through emails, but also you have, to, you have mental representation of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and, uh, and Putin and uh, uh, Bin Laden and many, many other people. So they are all in your mind, so to speak. So the number of contacts, real or imaginary, has also exploded. But your time has stayed the same. And, and uh, what is, I think what is also true is we, we have uh, vastly increased the number of options we have at any time. The things we can do. And this changes the way you are in time. Look, while you sit here, there are almost certainly some messages going into your email account. And there are some interesting informations you always wanted to know. And I assume many of you have, an I have, a, have a smartphone in your pocket, right? So you could do this now. <laughs> And a lot of people do, right? It's, 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 it's the multitasking. So this kind of, there is what I call the number of legitimate claims on you. And with claim, I mean things you could do and someone expects, ex sorry, expects you to do or you yourself want to do it. So the number of things you legit legitimately are expected to do or you want to do yourself explodes at any moment in your life. When you come home, I assume, right? if you're an average person, right? and you come home after the talk, you could either check your emails, or you could surf the internet for very interesting things, or you could turn to the TV, there are, I don't know, 200 channels, or you could turn to the D DVDs and Blu-rays you collected, or you could read all the books on your shelves which you never had the time to read, right? and so on. So the number of options, of possibilities, has exploded at any moment but not the time, you only have 24 hours for all the DVDs and, and, and so on. And of course you would say, well, where's the problem? I don't have to deal with all of, of them. Well, it's somehow true, but the problem is sooner or later you get into a situation where someone says, but you had the book at home, why did you never read it? And then you somehow feel guilty for this, right? So, uh, so what I want to say at this point is, we have increased the number of goods, we have increased the number of contacts and the number of options we have at any one time, but we only have 24 hours per day, so the consequence of this is that we feel pressed for time, right? Time is the, some say time is the scarcest resource we have for the 21st century. We can replace oil with other things. Maybe there's nuclear fusion or so. But you cannot replace time you have 
for your life, right? Okay. So, uh, so what is modernization? You can follow Luhmann, a systems theoretical approach that would say, well, in the material realm, right, what I call the dynamization of the world, which the aliens maybe observe, that creates an incredible amount of wealth, which we have, right, because we are really extremely rich, maybe not in terms of money, but in the terms of goods and materials, most of us have available, we are rich, and as a society in total, modernization has created wealth. Dynamization in the, in, the, in, the, in the realm of social life led to individualization, right? We are no longer tied to tradition. We are no longer tied to the small collectivities we live in. But we are, we have, we are, we are now as individuals face all these options. But in the temporal realm, this leads to acceleration, being pressed for time, feeling that you have to speed up your life in order to keep pace with a world that is dynamizing around you. Okay. Now, technically, I, I dealt a lot with this. I don't want to go into depth uh, with you today because, not, because I think uh, it, it, maybe it's not so important. But we can distinguish three different spheres of acceleration. When you say my life speeds up, what do you mean? I find this quite interesting. I think most of you, maybe you w would not be here if you didn't feel it's true my life speeds up. Now, what does that mean? I think there are three different dimensions of speed up in our society. The first is technological acceleration. This is the intentional speeding up of goal-directed processes, speeding up transport, speeding up communication and production. We had that when we discussed the cameras. But there is a side effect of the dynamization, and that's the acceleration of social change. The world around you does not stay the same. It changes all the time. The rates of change increase. When you stayed, uh, when you stayed in the countryside for quite some time and you come back to Barcelona, you might feel that you don't recognize this place anymore. This actually creates feelings of alienation, right? There's nothing seems to be as it was 20 years ago. The cafe you always went to is gone. There's now Subway, or I don't know what, right? <laughs> and, and the signs have now, they are now in English, and where you put in the money for your parking place, it's a totally different system. You cannot use the public phones anymore. In fact, the public phones are gone, and so on, right? And if the, if the fashion has changed, and you probably see a lot of foreign peoples which you have not seen before. That's a shock for people in Dresden, for example, in Germany, right? So the world is really changing around us. And that's true for, the, for, the whole, for, your, for your life conditions. In many aspects and realms, the, the world changes permanently. With the Hermann Löbe, you would call this a contraction of the present. Things do not stay the same, right? For example... Oh, it doesn't matter. I, do. I think you, you, you get the idea, right? The, 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 the world changes, and that has the consequence that you feel you have to speed up to keep pace with the changing world around you. You have to keep up with all the regulations in your working place. Take your working place, right? The machines you work with change all the time. The regulations you, you, that guide you change all the time. The partners you have to, to deal with change all the time. The clients you have to serve, they change all the time. I mean, I recently talked to some, uh, some, um, uh, some people who are, who are in the welfare state organizations, and they said, we are kind of desperate because we are supposed to advise our clients in order to find the best therapy for their kids in that case, right? To find the best place and the best, best program and the, and the best uh, therapists for the kids. But they said, we don't know it ourselves, right? All the programs change all the time and all the organizations change all the time and the conditions for getting payment from the, as, uh, from the um, um, insurance changes all the time, right? So people feel that the world is changing and that's different from technological acceleration. And it creates the feeling that we stand on slippery slopes, I call this, right? We have to run faster and faster just to stay in place. My, my favorite example for this is the email system. Again, right? I always come back to the email system. <laughs> because, uh, uh, look, I mean, I mean, when you, let's say in the morning, you want to go through all the emails that have accumulated through the, through the last day, right? So you are like standing on, a, on the foot of a hill 
So you run up and you answer them. Actually, it takes me longer and longer every day, but then at some point I'm on top, I've answered them all, right? And then you breathe freely. Finally, I can do some of the real work, right? And as you turn to your real work, whatever it is, you trickle down, right? <laughs> You're going down the slide because there are new emails coming in. After two hours, you're at the bottom again, right? So it's like, this is Sisyphus. And the same situation is that it's the case for, for your life all the time. For example, I buy the newest computer because I really want to be on top of technology. And as soon as I connect it at home, it's, it tells me, oh, unfortunately, your software is not at the newest uh, um, uh, condition and your virus protection is not up to date and so on. So I already fall back again. And it's even true for your social system. You think of, you need, you, you, you need to be in touch with your friends and also your relatives, right? Or you lose track of them. You, you are falling out of their networks, right? So we are standing on many, many escalators, so to speak. And on whichever escalator we don't run up, we are softly and quietly going down the hill, right? And this creates a situation where you feel, so when you ask yourself, what does it mean my life speeds up? It means the, the, the conditions under which you live change faster and faster. And you answer this by trying to run faster, to increase the speed of your life. That's what most people report. Uh, and this is what makes you feel breathless and in the hamster wheel. You try to get more episodes of action done per unit of time, get more things done per day. For example, be faster with the emailing. And what do you do? I mean, with the emailing, yeah, you, don't, you, you leave aside the greetings and, 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 and maybe even the name. You just say yes and no, and that's it, right? So you can uh, try to act faster or not make any breaks and pauses or do multitasking. Right? If you surf on the, maybe you do some emailing right now, so multitasking is a way of increasing the pace of life. And this has become a kind of self-propelling system, because when you feel that you are short on time, pressed for time, you want faster technologies. But the faster technologies change the reality you live in, they change the way you live. And therefore, it, it, it changes the, the feeling that you stand on shifting grounds, on slippery slopes, so that makes you run faster again, and then the self-propelling acceleration cycle is closed. So that was, that's what the dynamization of the world amounts to. Now, why is this a problem? Let's say, okay, that's the fact. It comes with the increase in wealth and with individualization, so it's a good thing. So where is the problem, right? Well, I would say there are three core problems of dynamic stabilization. One is in fact, this dynamization process, right, it's not driven, it's not kind of done by nature. We have to do it. And it really means, and, and this for me is where it really gets existential and important, no matter how fast you run this year, no matter how innovative and efficient and creative you are this year as a collectivity, next year you have to go faster. I mean, that's the matter of fact. And the year after that we have to go faster too. I think this is a perverse system, right? Because you can see it from a very easy example. If Spain, or Barcelona, or Catalonia, Catalonia, <laughs> if you decide collectively that for one year you go really, really, really fast, you keep your econom economy growing, right? And you're innovative. By, let's say you grow by 5%, it would be quite good, right? Then you would assume, okay, then next year we can take a little pause, right? Because we have been so, so, um, so efficient this year and we worked so hard. Next year we can be a little bit slower. But that's not true for the logic of dynamic stabilization. Because if you want to have 1% growth next year, then the more you grow this year, the more it becomes a problem next year, right? Because, because then 1% compared to something that has already grown. So, so there is no end to this. No matter how fast, how good, how innovative you are, next year you have to increase just to keep your place individually and collectively. And this energy, so you need energy to keep the system going. And the faster it is, or the bigger the economy already is, the more energy it takes to speed it up, to dynamize it even more. And energy has three meanings. First, it's material dynamization, and that's done by physical energies, basically by carbon-based energies or by, by oil. Right? John Urry, my British colleague, says, okay, Mr. Rosa, just wait. When we run out of oil, the whole acceleration game will fall down. 
basically, I don't think he's right. I think we will come up with new solutions. And if it's be it nuclear fusion or other things, right? But whatever it is, we need the, the acceleration needs more and more energy drawn from physical resources. But secondly, we also need political resources. That's what our politicians do. Look at EU meetings, or actually at all of your governments, the Germans or French or whatever. They try to speed up. They try to speed up life and uh, uh, to to make to to get more innovation from the young and to make the the old age people uh, more to include them in the dynamization game and and so on. But most importantly, for accelerated lives, in the end. The hamster wheel is driven by your energy and by my energy. It's us who have to keep the growth rates up and to come up with innovations every year. And that needs psychological energy, right? You have to be fit next year. You have to be uh, healthy next year, creative, and also a social being who is capable of connecting all the time with people, being nice and, uh, and, and good looking and so on. But also, but first of all, you have to come up with all the innovations and, the, and you have to do the work. Less and less people have to do the same amount of work. It takes psych more psychological energy every year to keep the engine going. But now, maybe if you want to understand why, why there is frustration in the world, and I think this frustration is very big, and Spain maybe is, it is, is, is ahead of, uh, of what you now see starting in Germany too. And this frustration, I think, of the acceleration game has to do with the fact that culturally there is a huge shift in the 18th century with this logic of increase and growth and innovation, there was a promise of progress. Life gets better through innovation and growth. And, the, and basically with capitalism, right? I told you that I think the logic of increase is built into the structure of capitalism, but there's something else built in it. And that's a hope, a promise. And you see it in the scriptures of those who defend capitalism, like Adam Smith and Ricardo, and even, for example, Willy Brandt said, our economic capitalist system will be so efficient that you can pacify existence. Right? We will overcome poverty. We will overcome hunger and scarcity because we are so productive. Right? We, are so, we, we raised productivity so far. And the promise was always that this will give you the freedom from economic struggle. You will not have to struggle for survival. You will not have to fight to have a place in society. But you, more and more, we can turn towards the arts, towards philosophy, maybe towards religion, to lead an ecological life, a moral life, an aesthetic life. That's the promise of capitalism. But of course, this promise did not come true. But you, you can, I was just in India. It's amazing how they, they put it very bluntly. And it's the same in China. They say, we have to, to get ahead of competition. And competition will get harder every year. The struggle for scarce resources will increase, and more and more competitors will compete. They are now all dynamizing. India is dynamizing incredibly. China is dynamizing incredibly, right? So we will not pacify existence. It will get worse and worse. You have everything you have. Your psychological energy, your political fantasies have to be invested in the acceleration game just to keep society as it is. It's a totally perverse and idiotic system, but the problem is, the problem now is, we feel next year we have to run faster, not to make our lives better, but not to go down the drain and fall into the trap we see in Greece and so on, right? So, there, so the perception is now, I call this accelerated standstill, right? That's the hamster wheel. Run faster, but don't go anywhere. And finally, I'm now coming towards the end. <laughs> Uh, finally, there might even be escalation or growth without uh, uh, stabilization. So it might well be that the economic, the domestic product in Spain is growing next year, maybe even considerably, but it will not lead to stabilization in the sense of integrating the unemployed or, uh, or, 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 or doing a better, a better social justice and so on. So in the end, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, b b b that's so to speak my diagnosis. I think. The problem of dynamic stabilization and acceleration is that the world is not speedable in all its realms to the same extent. There are some things in, in the world which you cannot dynamize easily. So there is desynchronization. The fast systems put pressure on the slow system. 
And one is the ecological crisis, right? Crisis. In fact, the warming up, the the global, uh, the global, the, the hothouse effect, the global warming, is literally a speeding up of the atmosphere. If you heat up a gas, you make the molecules go faster, and the molecules in our atmosphere, in the gas, in the in the atmosphere, go faster because of the material energy we need to keep the acceleration game going, right? And uh, but the eco the ecological problem is due to the fact that we are too fast for nature to regrow. We cut down trees at the pace which is too fast for the forest to regrow. We fish the oceans for at a pace which is too fast for the fish to regrow, and so on. So the ecological crisis is a crisis of desynchronization caused by social, by, by, um, social acceleration. And there is also a democratic crisis. You see it in Spain, in Greece, in Germany, in the US, and wherever you look. And that has to do with the fact that democracy in, it by itself, in its proper logic, is a slow and time-consuming process. It's not about being for or against refugees. Re democracy is the idea that you formulate positions and arguments, and then you enter into a debate, into deliberation. Let's find solutions. Let's form a, 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 something like a consensus, or at least a compromise. That's a political process by which we transform as a people as the citizens, and find collective solutions. But that's time consuming. And, and, and in fact, it gets even more time consuming when the world becomes more complex. But the logic of economic uh, uh, transactions and cultural and technological developments is acceleration, acceleration, accelerating. So democracy now is too slow, right? Uh, they are only putting out fires. They are no longer, sh it's no longer the instrument of shaping the world. So we have political de desynchronization. And finally, well, I think the financial, the, the financial desynchronization, that's just an interesting argument saying that you can speed up financial transaction up to the speed of light, but the real economy, the production of goods and the consumption of goods will always be time consuming. Have you ever consumed a book? I think you do not consume it when you buy it. Consuming a book means reading it, and that's extremely time consuming, right? And it's the same with the, even with music. If you buy the whole of Mozart's CDs, it's no, no longer expensive. You can do this very easily. You can also download it, maybe from Spotify, for nine euros. So that's easy, but that's not consuming Mozart. To consume Mozart means to listen to him, and that's extremely time consuming. So that's one reason for the trouble we see in the financial markets. The real economy is too slow for the speed of the financial markets. And finally, and maybe most importantly, at least for us as your ordinary citizens, there might be a desynchronization between the speed of social life and our human temporalities, the speed of our bodies. And you really see how we artificially try to speed them up, to, 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 to use sleeping pills to get to slow down in the evening, and then we knew we, you have not just coffee, but also Red Bull and Ritalin and other things to speed up and concentrate during the day. And many people report that they could not slow down until finally the body made them s stop, right, by getting some disease or so, or by breaking your bones. But I find it interesting when you talk to doctors, they say, well, sometimes even the body cannot stop the subject. The, the, there are increasing reports where the ambulance gets to a car accident and someone is badly hurt and says, okay, okay, you can take me to the ambulance, but before we get there, stop by my office because I have to do this and that, right? It's very interesting, right? But our bodies have speed limits and our souls probably have speed limits too, right? Whether you might speak of souls or not, you can also say psychic fabric. Alain Ehrenberg, the French writer, wrote about this. But what we experience as a burnout crisis, I, I really, I, I'm tempted to say I swear to you, this is not just a new discourse, a new idea by social theorists, because I was really surprised that it, because sociologists often think, oh, burnout is just a new term, it's a new discourse. In, in 1900, we talked about nervous breakdowns and neurasthenia. Now it's called burnout, it's nothing new. But the doctors and the psychologists say we have incredible exploding numbers of people who get into a situation where, there's, where they, so to speak, they fall from a very fast life into a total inertia. Time doesn't move at all. The connection with the outside world is lost. There is no resonance 
right? We no, they no longer feel connected to the world. They end up in a state of alienation. So my, my the small book, which Daniel mentioned, and uh, my new book, I, I published a new book, it's coming out in Germany today. It's called Resonance. And it's about the, the best way of connecting to the world, about the question of what, what is a good life in the end. I think that's what it all boils down, right? The question is, what is a good life? So, and, and this is my final slide, I swear, it's true. <laughs> because it's so depressive, right? So what I said so far means, okay, we are in this hamster wheel, there's no way out, and we are all going to be depressed, and that's bad. I think it's important to see that this logic of acceleration is not in nature, it's not a natural law, it's something, it's a social fabrication, right? It's the form of modern society, it's not a God-given thing. So what we need is a society that stabilizes adaptively, so to speak, right? I think we don't want to go back to the dark ages, uh, of course. So we want to stay modern in the sense of plural, being pl uh, living in a plural society, in a democratic and liberal society, and we need the capacity to innovate and grow when there is a, when there is a, a, a pressure from the outside, when there's a new disease, like the v uh, Zika virus right now, right? We need to be fast and innovative to overcome the problem. So we are looking, in Jena we have a huge research project going that looks for a post-growth society, a society beyond dynamic stabilization. And that, was, that, that needs to be uh, modern in the sense of liberal, plural, and democratic, and it needs to have the capacity to grow, but it doesn't need to grow just to preserve the status quo. And how can we get there? We certainly need a change in the economic system. The current form of capitalism won't get us out of this conundrum, right? I think some, there should be, in a new economic system, there should be some place for markets and competitions because they are very efficient ways of allocating things. But these markets have to be democratically and culturally controlled. So we are looking for new forms of a democratic economic democracy. And I think the welfare state has to be reformed uh, thoroughly too because the current welfare states only redistribute um, um, uh, redistribute uh, uh, increases which have to be gained in the first place. So I think for, for us as sub subjects too, uh, a guaranteed basic income could be a very good solution. But in the end, all of this won't help and we will never achieve it without a reorientation towards what a good life is. And I think a good life is a life led in resonance, coming out of the alienation, out of a wrong way of being placed in the world. But that would be the topic of my next presentation in Barcelona. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks a lot.